Welcome to SC25 in St. Louis, Missouri. That is the supercomputing conference to end all supercomputing conferences. And again, it's in St. Louis this year, uh, the home of the supercomputing organization. I'm Dave Nicholson with the Futurum Group and 6.5 Media. This is 6.5 in the booth. And I'm joined with a team from a very interesting company that a lot of you are familiar with, but maybe not familiar with what they're doing in this space, and that company is Castrol. You've heard of them all. You could even be a NASCAR fan and you've heard of Castrol, but we're gonna be talking about cool stuff in the data center realm. I have the CEO of Electronic Cooling Solutions, Bharat Vats, joining me. Vats, great, great to have you here. And I also have Darren Burgess, who is a business development director for BP Castrol. Welcome, both of you. Thank you know, you. I, want, I want to start with you, Darren. Let's just dive right into the biggest challenges that you're seeing customers having and, uh, and how is Castrol solving them? Yes, yeah, so let's uh, maybe focus on what's most important right now, probably this conference and to hyperscalers, to AI particularly, and that's liquid cooling. That's where we are. And so in the United States, particularly liquid cooling, direct to chip, uh, which, and then the liquid is known as PG25, propylene glycol 25%, water 75%. And we're just getting into really large deployments, full data centers of PG25 and direct to chip cooling. And so, yeah, the biggest challenge is people don't know what they don't know. Um, there's a lot of complexity in the fluid. You would think, hey, propylene glycol, kind of like antifreeze, water's water, how complicated can this be? but there's a lot of materials, chemistry, a lot of small channels, a lot of possibilities where this fluid can kind of get away from you. And so helping people to, you know, by developing some uh, really strong internal technical know-how to help the fluid be stable and to keep the lifetime so that you don't have to shut any part of that AI center down because of course that's big money. So I want to I want to highlight that because I'm going to ask you a question that sounds like you just touched on it, but <laughs> but why do people need to care about that? Why is it so important that it be the right liquid cooling solution? And when I say solution, there are two ways to think of that. There's literally the liquid in so, the solution, sure, and then there is the overall solution. But why is that so important? So I mean, just think think about the liquid. I mean, you can have all levels of redundancy in a data center. One thing you can't have redundancy in is the liquid. It's literally a single point of failure. And so it's the lifeblood, you can't let that get away from you. It has to be healthy in order for the cooling to keep going. You can't cool AI server with air. You've got to have the liquid cooling. And so you know, that, that's really how central it is. And this isn't just about the liquid itself, as far as Castrol is concerned. So, Tell us about your end-to-end -end service capabilities. What do, you, what do you do kind of comprehensively in the, in the cooling sure. space? Yeah, so you know, initially we're focused on installation, so we can help you put the liquid in, uh, make sure it's stable from the beginning, right? It's a lot of uh, you know, chemical tests, parameters that, that you want to look after, you know, pH, conductivity, that type of thing that determines the health of the fluid. How often do you test up front to make sure everything's stabilized? How do you test over the lifetime? Is, are you staying with quarterly? Do you get to biannual? Do you have real-time monitoring? And then, you know, hey, some, someday you may want to take things down, change some things out, it would help you either get rid of the fluid or, you know, possibly recycle it. So sort of an end-to-end -end with the fluid and, you know, may expand out from there with, uh, you know, testing, monitoring, that type of thing. So fair to say it's a bit more complicated than barrels and funnels? Is just. <laughs> just, a, just a smidge there, yeah, just a little. Vats, let's turn to kind of the, uh, a bit of the business side of things. Tell us about Castrol ON's strategic investment in ECS. How did that come about? And yeah, first, kind of, first, let's define those terms. So Castrol and ECS, what's the, what's the relationship there? Sure, well, first of all, Dave, thank you for me having here, right? Appreciate that. Uh, Castrol, well, this investment is, is a milestone for ECS, right? Think about a company like Castrol that breaks 125 years of experience, right? Handling all these uh, so-called the oil and the fluids in this space. And a company like ECS, almost three decades of testing, validation, modeling, you can't find a better synergy, right? Uh, so I think it's, it's highly synergetic, right? It's, it's a great strategic investment by Castrol. 
that enables ECS to expand their capabilities, right? Uh, we've been a small company, now we're going to go to the next level, and also it helps us to handle the complex and more bigger projects the company could not handle earlier, right? The way I see is this, the engineering expertise that Castrol brings in in this space from the fluids and the testing and uh, validation capabilities of ECS is not only going to help these two companies, but also all these customers in AI, high-performance high computing, and uh, all these spaces, right, data center servers, that will get real benefits, right? Fully tested, fully proven products, right, you can rely upon. So you, 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 you talked about some of the ways that ECS benefits from the investment of, sure. of Castrol. Yep. You may have left one out. Tell me, if I'm, tell me if I'm right guessing this. Now when you tell people you're with Castrol, they go, oh. <laughs> because maybe not as many people have heard about ECS. So, at least, so brand recognition, is that a fair? It is. And <laughs> let me tell you this. I think it's it both ways, right? Uh, and you, we've been known uh, very, let me use the right word, very secretly, the big five customer. They have been customer of the big fours with ECS. Okay. But now with this, there's a lot of brand equity that we get added with this investment, right? We, okay. we never had that. It brings the trust to our existing customer, to the bigger hyperscalers that cast all trusted ECS, right? The solutions are trusted and tested, right? And we, we carry that goodwill on our head now, and when we go and talk to those bigger customers, we get an opportunity to get bigger projects now. Yeah, good point. So yes, Castrol does bring the brand recognition, but the people who knew ECS knew it as a trusted brand before. So yeah. talk about the unique capabilities that ECS brings to the table uh, that really differentiates this, because the natural inclination of folks in the data center are going to be thinking, it's, it's fluid. You know, Darren, Darren went into some of the reasons why that's not the case, that it's critically important to get it right. But what, how, how do you differentiate, differentiate yourself in this space? Well, the way I see, uh, ECS brings 27 plus years of unrivaled depth of experience, right? We've got uh, engineers, PhDs working, not just once, multiple times on the solution that has been newer, kind of, the, you know what? And the second one is the breadth of across the industries you talk about automotive, you talk about medical, you talk about defense, you, the list goes on. See the applications, what ECS has been handling. ECS has been doing all testing of TIMs, called thermal interface materials, the primitive grease and then graphenes and moving towards uh, coal plates and now what we talk about liquid cooling, right? So I think uh, this, this helps us a lot to position ourselves as a, as a prominent engineering and consulting company for the liquid cooling testing. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Darren, with your background, is there anything surprising to you about the way that liquid cooling is being implemented in data centers, or is this just all thermodynamics and pretty straightforward? Anything, anything crazy about going into the world of cooling data centers for you? Um, I, I think what is most surprising to me, uh, given my background in you know, chemical engineering, material science, is just how complex of a materials chemistry problem it is. Um, there are so many materials involved in the, the whole cooling loop and the possibilities to you know, have particulates for anti-corrosion to go wrong, to have some kind of foaming. This, it, it, it's a very precarious liquid. It can really, really get away from you in terms of quality uh, quite easily if everything's not maintained. Now, if you're very strong and steady with the installation and the testing from the beginning and really pay attention, high quality water, et cetera, could be maintained for years. But it, it really takes a special level of attention. And, you know, and I think when, when you're looking at a $300,000 server and therefore potentially a billion and a half in hardware in right. the data center, the relative cost of the fluid, hey, it's, it's, it's water and antifreeze, how complicated can this all be? But as I said, single point of failure, you need to be careful. Yeah, and if you look, <laughs> Vats, if you look at some of the designs for you know, comprehensive liquid cooling systems, steampunk is the first word that comes to my mind. And we all sort of assume that the people who are building these things know what they're doing. But I'll tell you, this is the first time that I've heard reference to this idea that you're talking about this fluid going through and touching different materials. It's not just a stainless steel pipe 
No. You've got all sorts of fittings and connectors and materials that are, that are all at different temperatures, at different pressures. So there's an incredible amount of complexity to this. Any of that make you want to run for the hills? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the, first time that, the first time that we're going to hear about one of these 10 gigawatt data centers yep. not catching on fire, but having liquid damage. You know, how soon is it going to be before we're in that space? Does any, any of this make you nervous? Uh, well, I think it's, it's, it's exciting. I see both challenges and opportunities here, right? Uh, cha this thing never existed before in the history of the Earth, right? right? Happening first time, and it's happening at lightning speed. It's changing, right? Think, just like a couple of years ago, look at the, the server, the rack size. Look at the rack size now. Yeah. The problem is coming is that it's becoming more and more denser, right? And the more density of the power goes up, your heat that generated, the traditional cooling systems cannot handle that. Yeah. Like my friend said, air cannot handle it. You need specific solutions for that. Yeah. And when you have those liquid solutions, you need an arrangement where it can be go without leaks to your point earlier, right? Or is it contaminated? Or it's corroding something, right? And since this is new, you need a testing partner that can tell you, yes, this is going to work or this is not going to work, right? And that's where companies like ECS comes into play with, with Castrol. We got this liquid, we've tested this liquid under several hundreds of hours of testing, and we can tell you this, this is going to work. You can rely upon it. Darren, is there one, is there a, is, when I think, again, I know, bear with me, being sort of a petrol head, I think in terms of weights of, of motor oil, as an example, mm. are there variations depending upon the materials that, that, the, that the liquid will be going through, or is there essentially one formulation of the cooling liquid that's going to go into a cooling loop? Yeah, so you know, fo focusing on the directed chip, and it, it really is you know, one basic formulation. You need the 25% propylene glycol to be anti-biofouling. Okay. So you actually keep any kind of bacteria growth, et cetera, from getting away from you by having the 25% PG. Is it possible to do pure water? It is, but you better quadruple the intensity of your monitoring and your fluid you know, quality program, et cetera. Go with the PG-25. A couple of different ad packs out there. There's an inorganic additive technology, organic additive technology are kind of the, the two big camps. But really, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, you kind of come back to what is your total technical knowledge of how things can go wrong and what are you going to do if they start to go wrong in order to keep the data center operating. Okay, and, and Vats, a little bit, of a, little bit of a random question here, but we're talking about cooling loops where you're transferring heat, you're dissipating heat from these you know, semiconductors using, using liquid. Um, what about immersion cooling? Do you, do, you, do you have a view in terms of where that's going to go, or do you think that this sort of direct-to-chip cooling is going to be the primary way forward? I think this question is it's my personal one, Dave, I must tell you this, because I always try to answer this question to myself every day, right? It, right now, I think it's still the base on the loads, the base on the, uh, the power densities. I think the, the current liquid cooling system are sufficient, but as we go denser and denser, to your point, exchanging heat is not just the one problem, how fast you can exchange it, right? Yeah. And that's where this immersion cooling comes into the play. But as I said, it needs testing. It needs to be proven. It's going to work or not. Yeah. Liquid cooling has already proved. Immersion cooling needs to prove for that. Right? Is immersion cooling a, play, uh, um, uh, a space that you play in? Uh, do you have, you have fluids for immersion cooling? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. so for you, it's a question of fit for function. Correct. Whether it works. And then, of course, there's the, the um, uh, I've had conversations with folks talking about dissipating one megawatt yep. worth of heat mm -hmm. from a rack and they show me the kind of pressure and flow that's required, and now you start thinking I'm about the, the, you know, the anybody who's had a radiator hose blow in their yeah. lifetime yeah. Yeah, yeah. kind of yeah. scenario. Yeah. And it's just not the question of, of heat transfer, right? I think uh, Darren can talk more, he's a chemical engineer. At those temperatures, your coolant also decomposes, change the characteristics, right? You've got to take care of that as well. So yeah. it needs a liquid cooling and immersion depends on how denser the racks are. It's, it's crazy, there was a time when uh, only uh, gamers had their liquid-cooled systems next to their desks and uh, we all teased each other because we were nerds. And now the reality is uh, liquid cooling is becoming table stakes for some of this stuff. Thanks so much, both of you gentlemen,
for talking about this. It's a fascinating subject. On behalf of Castrol and 6.5 Media in the booth, I'm Dave Nicholson. Thanks for tuning in and stay tuned for more interesting coverage of SC25 and everything in the tech sector.